when we look back at the witch craze of the early modern period in history, we tend to think that it was caused by ignorant peasants whose actions might have been prevented through the influence of more educated people. However, history tells us that the educated and academic classes bear far more responsibility for the instigation and maintenance of historic mass hysteria than the ordinary folk. That statement is not for one second, seeking to, to absolve the ordinary folk of blame, as they have been the primary source for several mass hysterias over the centuries. Rather, history shows us that even a good education provided no protection from irrational behavior, and that academics are just as prone to believe in nonsense as the rest of us. Furthermore, many of the so-called intelligentsia engaged in deception of the public and sold complete balderdash to the masses as if it was genuine scholarship. As history repeats itself, bogus scholarship is again evident in Ireland's 21st century witch craze. Ireland's latest witch craze began in 2010 with false accusations that the women who ran a Protestant refuge for single mothers and their infants were in fact not only neglecting the infants, but starving them to death. Dr. Niall Meehan, a teacher of journalism at Griffith College in Dublin, appears to be the originator of the starvation myth. He incompetently interpreted the use of the medical term marasmus, used on a small number of death certificates and above-average infant mortality rates, as evidence of abuse. A case in point, is in this newspaper article, where Meehan helpfully informs his readers that marasmus or marasmic, was in fact another name for starvation. As we encountered in part one of this series, the claim is false, and due to ignorance. Meehan can be described as an activist and has made many representations to politicians and to the public, through letters and articles published in the media. After one such meeting with the Minister of Education in 2011, a few politicians became convinced that starvation of infants had taken place at the Bethany home. That can be evidenced in a statement made by Mary Lou MacDonald during an Irish parliamentary debate in June 2012. In 1939, the government's deputy chief medical officer refuted damning public and health inspectorate concerns in regard to the standards of care at Bethany Home, on the basis of a barbaric belief that it was normal for children of unmarried mothers to suffer from starvation. Meehan is quite clearly not a historian, nor an impartial observer, and is clueless of vintage medicine and reporting. Moreover, there is plenty of evidence in this and in his other writings to signify the presence of Irish self-loathing. More about that later. Almost to the day, and two years after Mary Lou MacDonald's scurrilous attack on the deceased Dr. Winslow Sterling Berry, Alison O'Reilly published an article on the Tune Children's Home in a British gutter publication. In the aftermath, the world's press went wild with allegations that children were not only starved to death at Tune 2, but to hide the crime, their bodies were dumped in a septic tank. This time, the alleged perpetrators were Catholic women. The only difference is that anti-Catholic sentiment will travel further and faster in Protestant dominions than anti-Protestant sentiment. The net result was the witch craze exploded into its maximum frenzy, and any semblance of the voice of reason was trampled under the noisy hooves of the stampeding herd. All kinds of fantasists, compo seekers, social climbers, political fools, gobshite journalists and communists, along with the full menagerie of cloven-hooved leprechauns, stepped forward to outdo one another with increasingly ludicrous tales of abuse. It was as if the Irish government had advertised for the position of witch finder general and got a tsunami of applications. One applicant, Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, got so excited that she wrote what must be the most incompetent history article ever to emerge from a university anywhere in the world. The choice of title, the Catholic cure for poverty, appears to have been chosen to direct as much hatred as possible away from the Protestant women, and point it directly at the Catholics. Furthermore, and despite the title, the main thrust of the article, is a deranged attack on the Irish political establishment. Such invective articles are common in Ireland, but tend to be written by people whose education in Irish history is defective and learnt mostly from the local bar stool bore. 
In one example of the many false claims made in the article, she wrote that the Irish constitution prevented women from doing work unsuited to their sex. That's a blundering and total fabrication. The relevant section of the constitution reads. In Article 45, Section 4.2, the Constitution of Ireland states. The state shall endeavour to ensure that the strength and health of workers, men and women, and the tender age of children shall not be abused, and that citizens shall not be forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their sex, age or strength. To interpret this passage as a ban on women working in certain occupations takes a very special kind of ineptitude. An ineptitude compounded with many more academically incompetent claims. For example, she informs her readers that, the 1931 Carrigan report revealed abuse was rampant in Irish institutions. Nowhere in the Carrigan report does it say any such thing. It is a blatant falsehood or a mistake of monumental proportions due to her qualifications in academic history. She even has the date of it wrong and is using it to promote the feminist nonsensical view of Ireland as a misogynist state. In fact, the Carrigan Committee explored ways of protecting women and children from sexual predators. However, the antiquated language of the 1930s has proven to be a fertile ground upon which the current generation of Irish feminists and self-loathers grow their conspiracy theories. Hence its current use and misuse. Paltering is the primary modus operandum of Ireland's most attention-seeking historian, Professor Diarmid Ferreter. Paltering is the art of telling the truth but telling it in a way that it misleads the audience. Despite benefiting from a Catholic education, he is notably anti-Catholic when expressing his views, and seldom misses an opportunity to have a go at the church. Astonishingly, he admits that he does not always present history with the balance required by the discipline of academic history. In 2018 he wrote, I won't pretend that I have always been able to achieve that balance, especially given that this newspaper's Peter Crawley suggested this week I am a historian, who conveys such personal anger with the past, that he seems ready to give it a headbutt. Balance is of prime importance in academic history because presenting one-sided accounts and arguments is regarded as nothing more than propaganda. Accordingly it is pseudo-history, which is one of the best tools available for brainwashing. Ferreter is associated with one of the most idiotic statements of the whole scandal. The state and church colluded to get rid of an embarrassment to Catholic Ireland. Typically ambiguous, he is hinting that the state wanted to murder illegitimate children as it was written at a time when the world's press was alive with tales of mass murder and an Irish holocaust. In any case, the article can easily be construed as encouraging the witch craze, and Ferreter missed a golden opportunity to demonstrate the power of education to triumph over hysterical fabrication. If he had any interest in producing a balanced history article, he would have informed readers that many women in the past murdered their unwanted children and that those who got caught were put on trial for murder. In one such case the judge commented, An illegitimate child is entitled to the protection of the law, just, as much as one born in lawful wedlock. Their lives are just as sacred as the lives of any other children, and that the state is prepared and has always been prepared to support and maintain them until they reach an age when they can work for themselves. Written in plain English, and abundant in the historical record, is the evidence that the Irish government, always, sought to protect the lives and human rights of illegitimate children. At no time did it enlist women to operate a baby disposal service to hide any embarrassment. The claim is not only untrue but worthy of ridicule. The truth is simple. Mother and baby homes existed as refuges for expectant mothers and to reduce and eliminate the number of infant murders. The statistics reveal that the vast majority of illegitimate children were born and brought up outside of the mother and baby home system, and that these children were not hidden away from society. Their birth status was well known by all in the community, while thousands of Irish grannies reared their daughter's illegitimate child. Ferreter's anger at Irish history is due to self-loathing, that peculiar form of Irish anti-Irish racism. Accordingly, when the red mist is present, reason and rationality are absent.
It is a cultural artifact born out of Ireland's impoverished past, a time when actual social climbing was impossible. Scientific research has shown that in many cases when a person feels inferior to others, they may attempt to overcompensate for their perceived deficiency by behaving in an excessively competitive manner, or by acting aggressively toward others. Ironically, people who suffer from an inferiority complex pretend to be big shots, and that is usually evident through snobbish behavior. Mostly, sufferers take out a bank loan, or lease a big car, but when financial circumstances do not allow for such comforts, sneering and begrudgery become the psychological equivalent of being seen in a Mercedes-Benz. Think of a wine snob sneering at people for drinking plonk, and you can observe the exact same mindset in people who sneer at their neighbors, relatives and fellow citizens. Putting other people down is a national pastime in Ireland. It creates a sense of warm psychological comfort, that is supreme to the cold comfort of reason. To be Irish and sneer at the Irish is to sneer at one's relations, one's family and at oneself, hence the term self-loathing. The raft of lies, in Sarah Ann Buckley's article did not originate with her. Like many young Irish people, she was socialized into believing that her parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles etc. were very backward people. As a history lecturer, her failure to check the truthfulness of her sources is an elementary error, that is further evidence of the bottom scraping standards, that currently prevail across the entire Irish education system. Irish universities are mostly funded by the government, and it is a sad fact of life that all organizations in receipt of state funds display a high degree of incompetence, which clearly the university system is not immune. A university that allows hysterical balderdash to be taught to its students can only be run by academics. Finally, the Irish university system has some brilliant historians, but none of them have been brave enough to challenge the idiotic output of their colleagues and the country's many fantasists. For this reason, Irish academia bears full responsibility for this 21st century witch craze.